Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. So uh, it's good to be back. Uh, we'll just pick up from where um, from where Pastor Jake's had stopped. Pastor Jay Kumar had stopped. Um, so uh, welcome to those who are new. I don't know if I've uh, met everyone here, but welcome. Uh, it's good to be back, really. OK, so we stopped at chapter 2. Is that right? Chapter 2? OK. Chapter 2. Oh. Just give me one moment, please. Is that chapter two or chapter one? OK, chapter two, I think we're at methods, right? OK. Right, so chapter two is talking about the purpose of the local church. Now, uh, just to go back a little bit so that we're all on the same page, uh, we understood what is the mission of the local church in chapter two, right? Jesus said, uh, I've given you all authority, go and make disciples. So that is the mission. And what was the message? Uh, the message is to preach the gospel, right? Like what we looked at on, uh, you know, every, every topic that we look at, the message is what? The message is the cross, right? There's no other message apart from the cross uh, that we can talk of. So that is the message that we want to talk about. Uh, and then finally, we'll get into the methods, right? Okay. Now, when it comes to the local church, if you look at different local churches, they have different methods, right? Every church has its own flavor. Now, for example, uh, I've said this many times, uh, if we're doing something in Bangalore, doesn't mean the same method will work in North India or in a different country, right? Methods will change. And so when we talk about a local church, this, the, the point, the main function of the local church is to bring people to Christ, to, to build the body of Christ. But the way we do it can have different methods, right? Now, when we use different methods in a local church, within those methods, there are certain characteristics or certain attributes that we must follow right so for example this is an example right if you're playing a cricket game right? you're playing cricket or soccer you can play it in many different ways but the rules remain the same you can choose to break the rules you can choose to follow the rules right now even in the local church there are different methods but what are the attributes while we're using these methods? What are the points or what are the things that we must keep in mind while building the church? Now, why is this important? Because you remember Jesus in the book of Revelations, he says to the church in Ephesus, he says, you, the church, you are doing some good work, right? As a church, you are doing some good work. But you have forgotten your first love. Imagine Jesus is saying that, right? That means what? Everyone are talking about you. Ephesus, you're a wonderful church, you're doing so much, but you have forgotten your first love. You're doing it just because you have to do it. And so we must be very, very, you know, uh, our mind should be very, very focused on, okay, if I want to build a local church, if I'm starting a local church, what are the methods I'm going to use? You can have conferences, youth missions, everything that we are doing, we can do it. But while we're doing it, how are we doing it? So we look at that right uh, today. Okay, so what are the methods? What are the standards uh, that we must use to, you know, to uh, in, in a local church, right? We cannot use carnal means to proclaim the gospel and establish a local church. Everyone know what is carnal, right? The word carnal, Paul is writing, he's saying it's a, it's, it's a flesh. You cannot use fleshly means to do something that is spiritual. That's what Paul is saying. Right? Now, some of us may ask, then how do we start a local church? Obviously, we have to 
you know we have to go we have to speak to people we have to prepare the sermons we have to preach we have to do a lot of things but even as we do it our it should not be out of our own flesh meaning i'm not doing something that should bring glory to my name or i should not be doing something that can put me on a pedestal I, that is the whole point so let's look at the first point right pure when we are starting when 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 we come to a local church our method must be pure right what is what is pure pure it simply means clean very clean right uh now again the choice is up to us as leaders how can we be clean and pure in our work remember remember what uh, david prays david had done something wrong right he committed adultery but what did he say he went back to god and said god create in me a clean heart some translations say a pure heart that means there's no deceit no hidden agendas everything is clean right so the methods we must use must be pure before god and man we must not use deceit or manipulation to achieve the purpose of our objectives right so we must not use deceit and manipulation we are not to manipulate people and say you know what if you come to church this is this is what will happen right now so this has happened many times where uh you know especially in uh, different in settings in towns and villages where pastor say you come to church god will heal you it's true and he's not saying anything wrong but then the moment if a healing does not happen let's say because you didn't do something wrong right or you didn't pray or you didn't read the word you didn't trust god or there's something that you have right and so again this becomes manipulating with the person right or you have to do this then only god will you know bless your family or then only god will provide for you so when we are doing ministry remember to keep it pure now uh, i think in the initial week we we went through the book laying the axe to the root right there are many things that can come that can distract us from doing a pure ministry you want a brilliant example i'm going back to the old testament but it's a wonderful example remember elisha and gehazi you know what happened in that story right what happened naman came said i have leprosy uh oh hold on please share the class link oh just hold on one minute right so yes i've put the link on the stream so remember elisha and gehazi elisha naman has come he's saying i have leprosy can you do something to me naman he says okay naman comes elisha says you go dip yourself seven times once you dip yourself you'll be healed then he's healed naman comes back and says what says to um, uh, uh elisha whatever you want i'll give you here's my money here's wealth the gold that i have everything you want you take it it's all for you elisha says i don't want it you can take it and go now what happened gehazi was listening 
as he was listening he said oh probably he's just standing back and he's watching elisha and he's probably thinking hey so much money we can do so much of ministry we can do so so many things with that and as naman is go, uh, as naman is going gehazi runs after and says you know what we need some finances for uh, for you know our ministry or whatever so naman says take what you want and then gehazi comes back trying to hide what he did elisha says where did you go right and gehazi says nowhere and elisha elisha says hey i was with you i saw what you did now what was wrong here god told elisha don't take anything but here gehazi changed it if he had not done it gehazi would have been next in line after elisha because elijah passed the mantle to elisha elisha was going to pass it on to gehazi but he messed up and so when it comes to ministry do not serve or minister with their own personal agenda as very dangerous right we need to serve knowing that we are preaching the word of god we are ministering to people so that people are blessed right and when we bless people god's promise is always there what does he say seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness all the other things will be added to you right so our motives should be pure look at what paul says in second corinthians 2:17 can one of us read that is there a mic there is okay second corinthians 2:17 Go ahead. Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. So this is Paul writing. He's writing to the Corinthians and saying, "Hey, we don't peddle the word of God. That means we are not preaching the word of God for an exchange of something." we are preaching the word of god because god has commissioned us to do it right so my the apostle paul is saying my motivation my thinking is pure whether you do anything to me whether you bless me whether you don't bless me it doesn't matter for me we are not peddling the word of god but with sincerity before god we speak in the sight of god in christ in sincerity god told me to do it i'm doing it right so and and then he goes on in second corinthians 4 1 and 2 he says the same thing i'll say therefore since we have this ministry as we have received mercy we do not lose heart but we have renounced the hidden things of shame not working in craftiness nor handling the word of god deceitfully look at those words he's using i'm not handling you know i'm not preaching and teaching because of any craftiness meaning not you know in a way to gain something from you i'm doing it because god has called me to do it right and not handling the word of god deceitfully but manifest but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of god now here's a very important thing that i'm going to say Sometimes we say, "Hey, I am right before God." Yes, I don't know what you think about it, but I am right before God. How many of us have said that? Right? Uh, you must be thinking I am wrong, but before me, before my eyes, before God's eyes, I am correct. I am right. I was. I also you have said it many times, but later on, I understood. Paul is saying here, "I was right before man." God and right before man. I didn't want any blame before God. I didn't want any blame before man as well. Later on, few years later, uh, they had to, you know, the church in Jerusalem ha had sent some money, and Paul, sorry, another church had sent the money. So Paul wanted to take that money and send it to Jerusalem, right? So what does he do? He takes two people with him. He says, "Both of you come with me." because i don't want to handle this money alone why because he wanted to be right before man he didn't want anyone to point fingers at him 
And so that is one of the reasons why at APC we we try to do things you know, with a pure objective. Right? We want to be right before God, but we also want to be right before man. Just because God is you know, probably using the ministry to reach out to many lives, touching many people, doesn't mean we are not accountable to man. We are accountable to man. We are accountable to the church, right? We are accountable to the people who are serving in the church, right? So in all our conduct, we should show ourselves as ministers of God, meaning we must walk the talk. It's easy to talk and not walk. Yes or no? Right? But we must walk the talk. If we are saying something, we got to do it. Right? Um, and second point, let's get to the second point. First one is pure. Second one, not offensive yet without compromise. Now, the word offensive means is it's. Uh, just hold on one second. Quite a few people are trying to join. Okay. The word offensive is, it, it doesn't, it means not to ridicule or mock somebody else, right? And yet without compromise. So our methods in ministry and our preaching must not intentionally offend people. Our objective is to point people to the person of Jesus Christ, tell them the truth, the truth of God's word. We do not compromise the truth, but we speak in love. Right? We don't compromise. We don't say, you know, it's okay. Right now you're living in sin. It's okay. God loves you. Now, what is wrong in that sentence? God loves you is true. But it's okay is not true. Why? Because sin is sin. And it has to be dealt with. Right? God deals with that. Right? So, so for example, we're ministering to somebody and God gives you a word. See, this is the sin that this person is living in. Now, we must be very careful. Right? We must not say, you know, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, <laughs> the God of Isaac and Jacob. This is the things that God is giving me a big vision. I see what you're doing. No need all that. You, Because what's happening is we are not being offensive, right? But we are not compromising also. What we are saying is, hey, so and you know, I see what is going in your life. I know that there's some things that you're doing. So God is willing to forgive your sins. But you must ask God for forgiveness. I can't do it for you. As many times people have asked me, hey, if I don't believe in your Jesus, will I go to hell? They've asked me directly. If I don't believe in Jesus, will I go to hell? What is the answer? Now, can I say no? Oh, hell. No, no, actually, there's hell. We'll talk about heaven. Forget about hell. Now, what's happening? I'm compromising the truth. Truth hurts, but we cannot compromise. Yet, we don't have to be offensive. You understand where I'm coming from, right? We, we, we must learn to be sympathetic, point people to Jesus, and say, hey, no matter what you're doing, the cross is a place where you can find forgiveness, right? And when you find forgiveness, there's there's nothing that you have to worry about. God will change your life, right? And First Corinthians 10, 32 and 33, give no offense either to Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Look at this. It's interesting, no? What is Paul saying here? Give no offense neither to Jews nor the Greeks. He's saying, the Jews, you may be following you know, all those offerings and all of that things. Give no offense. The Greeks, you all don't know what you all are doing. Whatever thing you all see, you all are worshipping. But I don't give an offense to any of that. I don't worry about all of that. Why? Because my main intention is that you all will be saved. Now, think of this. To the Galatians, what did Paul say? He says, you foolish Galatians. You, who has bewitched you? He's you know, being very rude to them. And uh, 
he's not being rude, but he's just burdened for them. Saying, why did you go back to circumcision? Did you get circumcised and then uh, you know you believed in Jesus? Did, was did the circumcision save you from your sins? He's angry. He's upset. But did he compromise? Did he compromise what he was preaching, what he was teaching? No. He took Timothy, he got him circumcised. So we must learn this balance when it comes to in the local church. How do I balance it? There are truths. Some truths are very hard. You know, 14 times Jesus said, talked about uh, you know, heaven and hell. 14 times. And seven of those 14 times, he said, I'm coming back. Very interesting. 14 times. And most of his preaching was about heaven and hell. Go back, read the Gospels. Yes, most of his teachings are about heaven and hell. He didn't compromise. But did he walk in love? Yes. Right? Did he, uh, you know, if you read Matthew chapter 24, this whole discourse, he was talking about the Pharisees. He's going on and, you know, you are a brood of vipers. You'll do this, you'll do that. You'll come to the offering. You'll come to the temple, but you'll don't, you don't worship with your heart. You're just doing all of this. But then he's not compromising, but he's also saying, hey, come to me all who are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. So you see that balance that Jesus walked with. And as a local church, we must walk in that balance. Right? So don't offend people, yet don't compromise. So for example, if uh, somebody invites you right, to a church or to a meeting and you're preaching there, you have to preach the gospel. You have to talk about sin. You have to talk about heaven, hell. Even if you're talking about it, don't be offensive. No, but don't compromise. In a loving way, we do it. Right? Thirdly, third point, demonstration of the Spirit and power. Christian ministry is really the work of God's Spirit through His people. It is supernatural. Right? Everyone say supernatural. If we are doing ministry, depending on our flesh, we will only go to a certain extent. We can't go beyond that. Ministry equals supernatural. There has to be the supernatural. Why? Because God is a supernatural God. So when we do ministry, expect the demonstration of the work of the Holy Spirit. Expect the power of God to be released. Right? There will be signs, wonders, and miracles. You know, we've been talking about the book of Acts this all these Sundays, right? Last Sunday we brought it to a, yesterday, we brought it to a close. But what did we learn? Simple people. The first sermon, Peter is standing there. Have you ever thought of these things, right? Peter, the guy who denied Jesus, said he was not even near the cross. And there he's standing there. Hey, let me tell you what this what is happening here. And he's pointing to Joel. That will, you know, uh, your sons and daughters will prophesy. You will dream dreams and visions. He's pointing to Joel. He's, he's standing in such boldness. Same Peter. And there were so many signs, wonders, and miracles. Why? It was supernatural. Now, think of this. If it was something natural, do you think we'll still be talking about it? Do you think we will be talking about, you know, the church and all that's happening? about Jesus, if it was just something normal. How many people know Alexander the Great? Maybe many. But how many people know Jesus? Much more than that. What is so special about him? What is so special about the church? Look at the early church. Why was it that you know, the church was impacting the places? Look at Ephesus, Corinth. The church was impacting people. People who were living in sin all their life, they heard the gospel the first time they came into the church, their lives are changed. Why? Because ministry is the work of God's Spirit. The Word of God is so powerful that it can go into our spirit, our dividing, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Hebrews 4.12. Right? 
So when we read the word of God, it's a supernatural word. When we minister to people, supernatural. Think of it that way. The local church is a place where uh, the, the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit is released. Right? 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Look at what Paul is saying. Now, Paul went to Corinth, right? And Corinth is in Greece, and they are very intellectual people. So Paul is saying, hey, see, I did ministry. But it was not only all these big words that I used, righteousness, justification, purification, atonement, uh, what else? Glorification, all the cations. It's not about those words. It's not about, you know, because I know the Old Testament, because I you know, studied under Gamaliel, I came and I spoke to you. And I spoke with all fluency. I can speak Aramaic. I can speak Hebrew. And I stood and spoke. That's why you all believed. No, it's not about persuasive words. It's not about the style of how I'm speaking. It's not about my, uh, you know, no, the fluency of my speech. It's not even about the, the wisdom that I have. Was Paul full of wisdom? Great wisdom. Right? Because of the you know, the whole understanding that he got from the Old Testament, and then he could point it to Jesus, and he was able to just understand the go like the whole gospel. But he's saying, it's not in my own wisdom also I came to you. I came to you, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that you don't rest on my wisdom. Don't rest on my wisdom. But don't rest on the way I'm speaking. Don't put your trust on me. But trust on the demonstration, the spirit and of and of power. First Corinthians 4:20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Right? So he's saying it's not just speaking. Imagine Jesus came, think of this. Imagine Jesus came and he said, You know, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Son of Man. Right? Come to me, all who are weary, I'll give you rest. Or, you know, you have all these uh, sick people. And Jesus said, you know, I'm the healer. I can heal you. And I said, okay, heal. He said, you come tomorrow, I'll heal you. <laughs> the Lazarus is dead. Remove the stone. Anything is coming from there? Uh, there was no, you know, Lazarus, Jesus was not uh, confused about who he was. He knows who he was. Right? He, he knew his authority. So the kingdom of God was not only about speaking. When Jesus says that this is what I'm doing, it was also a demonstration of the power. Wherever he went, he taught, he preached, there were signs, wonders, and miracles. And so that should be, you know, whatever tools we use. You know, during Jesus' times, there's no Facebook, Instagram, all of that. No youth concerts, worship evenings. All that is not there during Jesus' time. But now we have it. While we have it, what must we, what must we look for? What must we look for? What must we expect while we have all these events? God's, God's presence? Yeah. What else? What must we expect? If you're going on a Sunday or you're going for worship evening, what must you expect? Good sound? That's also good. Sorry? Supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles, Lucy. Of course, sound and lightings, all of that is there. They are meaningless if the Holy Spirit is not there. Yes or no? Right? So is that important? Yes. Right? Because we are not we are not in 1980s. We're in 2024. So we have to behave like that. But we don't give lightings and sound the first preference. And then, you know, Holy Spirit, if you decide to come, you come during the third song. That doesn't work that way. Right? So our mind, in whatever method we do, whatever we 
whatever event conference we do must be the demonstration of the spirit and of power okay fourth one everyone with me okay fourth one spirit directed now the plan strategies and methods used by the local church in the ministry must be spirit directed that means what as we plan as a church we must depend on the holy spirit on what we must do right now remember this the holy spirit and if you're a pioneer or you're leading a church you're making decisions for the church the holy spirit because we have also learned about the holy spirit the holy spirit will witness to you do this don't do this right wait for some time right that's what he'll do so we in the book of acts it, it, we see here that the believers went about doing what they knew they had to do we see the holy spirit giving them directions altering their plans and the holy spirit being the director of what was being done during that time and even now the holy spirit is our director right so you know when we look at look for example look at bible college right it's not something a decision that we made overnight it's not a decision we made overnight okay what should we do what are the courses what are the timings especially when 2020 came you know i remember we all uh, as a, as the, the faculty the teaching staff we all came together we were all in different places but we all came together online and started discussing what can we do now because we need to have bible college and we can't meet in person so then we you know we we all got together and we started discussing we said okay let's do this anyway people are at home we, they can come online and so we'll we'll have it online then what we can also do is since we're having it online let's record the videos and then we'll have another platform where people who are working from home or working elsewhere they want to attend but can't attend so what do we do for them so we'll record the video we'll open a platform and we'll put the video when we put the video whenever they want to watch let them watch so by the end of the semester they'll have to finish the things okay second one then okay what do we do for uh, you know international students how do we help them out so many things was involved right now the idea came it was just one idea but god gave the idea surrounding that it's our responsibility to fulfill it god won't come and open google classroom for you holy spirit thank you for opening google classrooms <laughs> holy spirit will say do it yourself yes or no right but the idea came from there that is called being spirit directed and i've used this example before where you know we used to go as a staff we used to go and teach uh, in different states right uh, up north of india go and teach stay there for a week come back and we thought okay because initially we had a smaller space for bible college but now that we have a bigger space an idea came we were discussing talking hey why don't we say we can get 100 people to come and sit here so instead of we going there teaching we we'll get people to come here and we'll get them to come during the break so when th this you the, your, these students go the the students we do a sh two two month course finish and they go back so so there was planning that's all spirit directed but all of this comes by spending time in god's presence and then god drops the plan and we together plan around it what needs to be done so acts 829 then the spirit said to philip go near and overtake that chariot that's all think of this philip is there philip is god is saying the holy spirit is saying go near that chariot go near that go near and overtake this chariot the holy spirit didn't say now open to the book as, as you reach there open to the book of isaiah but that's a good book no they will know so you open and you start preaching nothing go and overtake the chariot he went there then 
then he had to make the decision he didn't say okay now what god what do i do now i'm near the chariot what do i do god will say it's obvious why did i bring you here so he was able to and just that one sentence what is that sentence go near and overtake this chariot he preached to that eunuch and that took the gospel into africa can you that's, that's that one sentence right so as a local church be spirit directed ask god now what about times when nothing's happening like you know the holy spirit is not speaking to us no problem wait or continue doing what you're doing simple right now for example two years down the line the holy spirit may say do a separate course for teens example right i don't <laughs> just an example do a separate course for teens keep them for two months and do a separate we may say it. we may do it right until then just do what we are doing right so even when when it comes to a local church very important is to be spirit directed and now being spirit directed doesn't mean that moment only September, you want to have a September 15th, you want to have a conference. Don't wait till September 10th. What is the theme of the conference, God? Holy Spirit, tell me what is the theme. Imagine September 10th, you're waiting for the theme for the conference on September 15th. What will happen? It'll be a disaster. It is not going to work. Right? So that is why we have one year, whole year, everything is ready. Right now, 2025 calendar is already ready. All the events, all the programs, everything is ready. Now you may ask, how is that spirit directed? It is. Because the Holy Spirit will, min, will speak to us. Right? Okay, you do this at this time, do this at this time. And the themes, the everything. The Holy Spirit is using what we have to push the agendas, to get the things done. And so we must also be you know, very um, sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. Fifth point, be strategic. Now, everyone knows what's the meaning of strategy, right? What is a strategy? Strategy is plan. Without a plan, you're failing to plan, you're planning to fail. You have to plan, have a strategy. Imagine the Indian army doesn't have a strategy. They're sitting on one morning, they're sitting around, you know, relaxing, having tea, coffee. And then they're seeing the enemies coming. No, no, you have nothing will happen. <laughs> you have chai. We, they won't cross that border. <laughs> will that happen? Do you think they'll do that? Or they're seeing the enemies coming. Oh, give me a piece of paper fast. Let's write a strategy. How to defeat these guys. They're coming very close. It's not going to work. By the time this guy finds a pen, the enemy will be defeat them. A strategy is very important, right? The local church must have must be strategic in its methods. Means to move with God, in step with Him, in time with Him, aligned to His leading, positioned in the right place at the right time, and the Lord will, you know. Uh, you know, at, at, at the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing to minister to people. You have to be ready. You have to be strategic, right? Now, how do we be strategic? One, purposeful. Doing the right thing that God wants, it, God wants done. So, purposefully do things. Now, look at, look at Bible college, right? It's been so many years. Students come, graduates come, people, students come, they study with us, they graduate, they go back. They come. It's been happening for the past so many years. Many students I've seen, you know, sometimes they, they messaged me recently saying, I was in the 2014 batch. Oh, oh good. <laughs> and they've started a church. And uh, yeah. I don't remember them because so many students, right? So sometimes we may feel, you know, we are teaching year after year, and we may not know the fruit that is happening outside. But there is a fruit. 
That's why we always are purposeful. Whether there are three, whether there are ten, we're going to teach. Or whether there's hundred, we're going to teach. Right? Because we're being purposeful. This is what we're going to do. Nothing will change that. Right? So you have a purposeful strategy. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Timely. Doing it at the right time. Can we have Bible college uh, 4 p.m. to 9 p.m.? We can. Nothing wrong. Is it going to work? Very unlikely. What will happen? We can't be at home firstly. Staff will be sitting and teaching. Faculty. And you guys will be half asleep. You want to go by well, what timing is this? You know, initially in Bangalore, I don't know if it's there now. Yeah, those evening colleges. So people will we'll be all like tired after school, going back home. These guys fresh, they'll be going into walking into college. I always used to wonder why is there an evening college? Doesn't make sense. But for them, it makes sense because for them, morning they're working. I can't get a job in the evening. Right? So be timely in what we are doing. Is it the right time to start a teen church? Is it the right time to start a conference, to have a conference? Imagine we, um, 2020, we said, see, we are God is greater than any COVID and all. So we are having a conference. Can we do that? People did it, surprisingly. No, we don't believe in COVID. They did conference. And it became a problem. Oh, persecution. No persecution. You just have to use your own. Right? So we got to be timely in what we do. Understand whether we're doing it at the right time or whether it's the right time or should we wait for a while. Be adaptable. Changing our approach as directed by God. Different methods for different kinds of people. Now, what we speak to a couple, we cannot speak the same thing to, it, to teens. So, for example, now, uh, September onwards, we're going to be talking about end times in church. Now, there may be some teens who will like it, but eight out of ten teens may not like it. Oh, what is this? All end times and all beast is coming, dragon is there. Sounds like this, uh, you know, movies that we see nowadays. The teens may feel that way. So, we have a teen church. They can talk about something relevant, something that they are going through in their lives, right? So being adaptable, being able to change things is very important. Four is well-planned, having foresight and foreknowledge of things and being prepared, right? So, so having foresight simply means to look ahead, to look ahead. And I've said this many times, you know, um, I think it is 2010, uh, could be the year, but I could be wrong, 9 or 10. And uh, <clears throat> I remember once a pastor was saying, one day our Bible college will reach out to all across the nations. And I was there in that congregation. I remember it very clearly because I seen the Bible college. I was a student of the Bible college. So I know. So how will this Bible college reach out to countries all across the world? You see, my thinking was small that time because I was small. But the foresight was one day it will happen. How it will happen, I don't know. But it will happen. I remember that very clearly. And now it's happening. That foresight. So as a local church community, you must have foresight. You must see yourself what you will be in the years ahead. It's not only about numbers, but also about people. How many lives do, are we impacting? How many people are we touching? How many people are we raising up as leaders? Now, for example, okay, you may have 100 people in your church. You have two worship leaders. But by the end of the year, you can, if you have four worship leaders, you've made good progress. You have raised up two leaders. Or if you have five people making declaration, now, by the end of the year, you have 15 people making declaration. Oh, you're, you're raising up leaders. So that's growth. You're seeing your foresight. Right? It's, it's not like, okay, oh, hey, 100, I'm still on 100. No. 
you look at people also people are also being raised up as leaders right and that is the foresight we must have as a local church right and then be well executed meaning doing things with excellence so that god is glorified and i think this over the last few years as a church i would say personally that we have really you, you know improved the way you know our conferences are done the way we uh, you know do our uh, media and graphics really improved right if you go back to the old videos 2000 and i think 12 onwards you may find some videos right? it was not like what it is now right so as we are growing as a church we also need to grow in excellence because that's a responsibility that god is giving us right and then sixth one be relevant god communicates with us in ways we can understand he speaks our language so when god is ministering to us sometimes we get dreams and we we understand that oh i know now what to do or the holy spirit will just speak and say okay now you know okay this is what i have to do but sometimes we don't know i got this dream i don't know what it means and what do we say you'll come to the pastor and say pastor i got this dream pastor will try to explain it or other anyone you know any life group leader whoever will try to explain it and then they'll say you pray ask god to speak to you or to explain the dream to you why he will because god speaks our language so as a local church we must speak a language that is able to uh you know relate to the people in our audience right now when i say language doesn't mean english and the the regional language meaning i must be able to communicate clearly to the local church right uh be relevant to the local church that we are in right now right so many times um you know parents come up to me after church and they say you know this is the problem that i'm facing you know uh, it will either be with the children or uh, at the workplace so i must be relevant to them i cannot say hey i haven't worked in the workplace so you are somebody else no i need to learn i need to learn how to be relevant these are the things you are facing okay in a workplace so there are things i'll have to read up there are things that i have to learn to be relevant to them right and paul is writing here first corinthians 9 he's saying i have made my 19 onwards for though i am free from all men i have made myself a servant to all that i might win more to the jews i became a jew to the gentiles I, to those under the law i became those under the law that i might win those under the law to those who are without the law as without the law to the weak i became weak to the might that i might win the weak i've become all things to all men that i might by all means save some now this i do for the gospel's sake that i may be partakers with you he is not saying this i do so that you can understand me no he is saying i do this for the sake of the gospel so what is he saying here to the weak i will be weak and he is saying weak he is not talking about a physical weakness he is saying spiritually Right. there are some people who are weak i'll be weak with them i won't go to those who are weak and say hey you know what one day i went to heaven then in heaven i met uh, gabriel and all these angels no to the weak i'll be weak i'll just talk something simple right i'm not going to bring big things upon them big revelations upon them but to the strong those who are able to understand right i'll give them what they need that's why paul is writing to the corinthians and saying by now you should be eating meat but you all are still drinking milk meaning you all are like babies you all should have grown up by now your understanding your thinking is very low so paul is saying i have to come down to your level now but why is he doing that so that he can win those who are in christ we must be relevant without compromising the message we must use methods and means that help people understand and apply the message and then we must remain sensitive to the culture without you know uh, uh being controlled by the culture what is the culture nowadays that we see around us right uh, 
lesbianism, LGBTQ, uh, God is, there's no God, atheism, all kinds of things happening. Let it happen. You don't change what the message we are preaching. God is bigger than the culture, right? All right, so we'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll start with chapter three.